all to the organizer to um, have him speak at, uh, at the conference in honor of Craig here and Mel. Um, my talk is a, a joint work with Alessandro and Stephanie. Um, so I'll, uh, I want to talk about uh, how to bound uh, uh, invariants of prime ideal. But I'll start uh, by discussing some, uh, some theme. So they look for uniform bounds. As, uh, as Baron mentioned, I mean, this search for uh, uniform property and so on is a very uh, important trend in uh, community algebra and also important in the um, trend in the work of, of Craig. Um, so the setup that I want to consider is mainly from a computational point of view. So let's say I want to, uh, well, first of all, let's set up my ring is going to be a polynomial ring over a field uh, K, so K field. Um, I, throughout the talk, is going to be uh, a great homogeneous ideal. And what I want to do, I want to uh, fix uh, some, uh, some data. I'm gonna spread. And uh, once I fix the data, what I would like to do is, uh, well, let's say I want to, oops, noisy. So I, not uh, bad too. I want to bound um, invariance, basically. So, for instance, um, let's say number of generators, um, petty numbers, Casanova amount for regularity. Let's say, since I'm taking a computational point of view, sites of Grobner basis. And I want to do this uh, basically uh, for all uh, ideals uh, satisfying, uh, satisfying the data. So the data is fixed, uh, and ideally you want to bound uh, invariants. And this is a possible list, of course not. <laughs> Small list. Um, so uh, just want to mention a quote from yesterday from David Eisenberg from his talk that he said, the field revolve around the sides uh, of Betty numbers. So my focus is going to be on those, controlling the sides of Betty numbers. Um, some examples of, uh, of this type of uh, problem. Let's say, uh, let's say my idea I is generated by F1, uh, Fr, let's say of degrees, uh, D1 uh, and so on, uh, up to dr, this sequence of degree I will denote it with a vector D. Um, so in this case, uh, the data is, uh, is D and, uh, and N the number of variable of, of the ring. So with this type of, uh, of data, um, first result, uh, as I want to mention, is the theorem. Um, well, some version of it in, uh, in Bayer's thesis in 1982. Sorry. I apologize for the noise. Um, Other people, uh, it's basically bound on the sites of Grobner basis. Uh, Merler, Merler Moore, uh, Dubé, many people work on this type of topic. Uh, I want to mention also Mark, uh, Mark Chardin, uh, Hoa, uh, many other people, including my student, uh, recent, one of my recent students, uh, Liang. And, uh, and the result is this one for every, for every ideal and for every uh, term order, 
the, um, the size of a Gronberg basis is, uh, is under control. So basically the largest degree of a minimal generator in the initial idea with respect to this, uh, this monomial order, term order, of i is bounded above by a basic double exponential function of d um, and n. So here, let's see, let's write it two times. Uh, uh, I'm going to write the Dubé version, d squared plus over 2 plus d to the 2 to the n minus 1. So it's a double exponential on d and, uh, and n. Um, so that's the first result of the sphere. So fix the data, and the invariant is sites of the Gromberg basis, and here's the bound. Uh, example number two, um, Castle-Roman for regularity, so a theorem of, uh, um, tell me, the what? Ah, capital D, you're right. So little d, let's say smaller than d, d, d. I'm trying to make my life easier. So it's the largest little d, perfect, <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, let's see, uh, Giusti, Giusti Galigolo. Uh, Bayer, Bayer Mumford, uh, several different versions of similar bounds, uh, I mean, improvement uh, on the uh, type of bounds. Uh, myself and, uh, and Enrico, Vara, uh, Marshall Dan, uh, Oa, many other people, perhaps even more recently, uh, myself and, uh, and Stefan in a different uh, um, in a different collaboration, um, one gets uh, the regularity of, of the idea for the fixed data is bounded above uh, by d to the 2 to the n uh, minus 2. I mean, to get rid of some trivial case, let's say that n is at least 3. If you're just in two variable, everything is, uh, is trivial. Um, another type of, uh, of bound of this flavor, perhaps, uh, actually, uh, I'm going to call this a corollary. A corollary of this uh, is basically a bound on all the Betty number. So if you fix i and j, the i and j Betty number of i, for instance, uh, can be bounded above by, I'm going to take this number, d to the 2 to the n minus 2, uh, choose i, for instance. Actually, let me write it slightly differently. I'm going to write it as uh, uh, d to the 2 to the n minus 1, let's say. And the reason of this is basically because uh, uh, you have a Betty number BAJ, which is bounded above by a total Betty number of I. Total Betty number of I, once you know the sites of a Gromner basis, by upper semi-continuity, you can bound this with the Betty numbers of the initial. And the initial, the resolution is easy from, I mean, some control on the resolution is easy from, uh, from Taylor. So basically, this, uh, thanks to the Taylor resolution, plus perhaps the proof of two, something like this. You get uh, uh, d to the two to the n minus two, choose i, the choose i comes from Taylor, which is smaller easily than d to the two to the n minus one. Anyway, so two examples. Uh, once again, sets of government basic irregularity and uh, embedded numbers. Now, the problem becomes way much harder if the data, uh, instead of fixing uh, the, uh, if instead of fixing um, um, the, uh, the number of variables, we work uh, in an unknown number of variables. And that we go uh, into uh, Stillman conjecture land, basically. So, Stillman's conjecture type, uh, type of problem. Now, the theorem due to uh, Mel and uh, Tigran. Again. Oops. Okay. You know what? Okay. Um, so, What's the setup here? Um, still i, in say polynomial ring, now I have uh, x1, x big n. Uh, let's say number of variables big n unknown. Um, so the data here is just uh, the degree d. So 
So with this type of data, the, the solution, the Stirma conjecture, is basically theorem by uh, an onion and oxer. This says that if you look at, if you care for the projected dimension among the other invariant, they didn't place the projection dimension at first because I had n as my number of variables, so then n would be an easy bound for the projected dimension. But if you look at every possible, uh, um, every possible ideal, so let's say for every i and for every n, and let's say we're looking at the projected dimension of i, this number is actually finite. Not clear what the, what the number, actually, what the actual, actual value is, but the point is that there exists uh, a, a bound that only depends uh, on, uh, on the data, the degree of the generator. It's, it's independent of the number of variables. Similarly, from a uh, byproduct of the proof, also from their paper, one gets uh, bounds on basically every other, other data that you can get from the resolution. So, uh, for instance, uh, regularity of i um, is finite. Uh, and the supremum, let's say, of every, uh, for every i, for every n, for every i and j, of the value of the betting number bij of i is also finite. Again, not clear what, uh, what the value, what the, what the bond can be, but it's, uh, uh, I mean, there's a horrible, horrible recursion <laughs> from this proof, and, and it's uh, unthinkable what the, what the value actually are. Uh, but, um, if we care for betting numbers, um, let's say, I'm gonna change sides. If you care for a, a betting number, especially for a single betting number, let's say not the class of all the possible betting number in the resolution, then the, the task become easier. I want to give you an example of that. So, um, let's say two bound, a single bij, of i, in this case, let's say, uh, fixed the pair i, i and j, it's easier, uh, it's easier. For instance, let's say I start with an idea generated by uh, three quintics, f1, f2, f3, uh, or degree five, so five, five, and five, that's my degree sequence. Um, <coughs> then I can ask, for instance, what's a, what's a good bound for the betting number in homological position six, uh, shift 12 uh, of i? So can, can we go on that? Again, no, num no variables. I mean, I, I mean, still my land in some sense, but I fix a single betting number. So task is easier, as I was trying to say. But if you just follow the, the you know, if you try to control stuff with this, or, I mean, with the proof, uh, it would be absolutely crazy. But yeah, the, the things are not too bad. <laughs> and what you can do, you can compute uh, an initial of i. And well, you start with three quintics. So the initial is gonna start with uh, three Quintic monomials, and those are, let's say, let's give name, or, well, Q1, Quintic, Q2, Q3, so these are degree, degree five, and I'm gonna compute this using a, basically I'm gonna compute a Grobner basis. And if you compute a Grobner basis, you have initials, uh, and you have to do S pairs, leading, leading, S pair, you're gonna look for at least multiple, maybe something's gonna reduce to zero. But between them, there are only three S pair that you can consider. At most, three S pair correspond to, at most, uh, S1, S2, S3, perhaps they're zero, but these are at most the number of uh, things of degree six uh, that they can expect uh, in this in, plus uh, larger, larger degrees. Well, so if the in contains those monomial, three quintics, and three things of degree, um, uh, degree six, then uh, we can uh, estimate the betting numbers, because basically we have uh, a you know, Taylor resolution, a hypothetical Taylor resolution using this data. So the betting number bij of i is bounded above by the betting number b i j of the in, which is bounded above by essentially 
the T, what do you expect from T? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. I'm going to stop at 6. Uh, there's nothing here. I start in degree 5, then there is degree 6. Uh, degree 5, 3. In degree 6, I have three generators. Uh, and from the, let's say, uh, Taylor, or if you want the LCM lattice, you can get this number under control. So uh, let's say 3, 1. Uh, uh, after that is 0, 0, 0, 0 in this trend, uh, 3, 15, uh, 20, 15, uh, 6, 1, uh, and finally I get uh, a 0 here, and that's the position that I care for. So the bound here was 0. Hmm? Okay. Okay. Ah, mistake. <laughs> So, what's next? So I want to change the data a little bit, and I want to focus on primes, prime ideals. So, focusing on prime, uh, my data is going to be the fact that the idea i is uh, actually a prime. And another part of the data that I want to fix is that the multiplicity of, uh, of S mod i, of the prime, is fixed, uh, is fixed, and let's say some number here. So fixed multiplicity fixed the fact that uh, we're working with prime. So here there's a heisenberg goto it was heisenberg goto conjecture. But now, now false uh, um, because of the Cantor example of McCullough uh, uh, Jason. And Irena, Eva, which basically says if I look at the, the supremum of all the possible P satisfying my data and I care for the regularity of P, this number cannot. Uh, be bound, cannot be bounded by a polynomial function of, uh, uh, of E. Uh, by the way, I wrote as in but go to conjecture. So the prediction of the conjecture was that the regularity of prime was bounded above by multiplicity minus. Uh, uh, height of the prime plus one. But in particular, this is less than, than the multiplicity. So the reason we are going to put the predict the multiplicity as a bound for this type of things. So the, their proof, I mean, they have a counterexample, great. Uh, but after there was a counterexample, you start realizing that the focus for many, many years uh, of people working on this conjecture was actually to prove the conjecture, which is perfectly fine. It was the optimal statement. But once you realize that, the next question is, OK, well, fine. Let's settle for something else. Uh, what's a good bound? Anything. I'll take anything. And the point is uh, that in, the, in their paper, Irena and Jason uh, ask, uh, well, is there a bound at all? Because uh, so can the regularity be bounded, uh, not even like that, but just by anything as a function of the multiplicity. So, question, is there a bound at all? Uh, so, this bound uh, cannot be bounded. So, question, is it uh, at least uh, finite? Is there a bound? Uh, or perhaps I can look at generator. Is the supremum over all those prime of the number of generator, B0 of P, finite. The answer to both questions is basically uh, positive. So as a consequence of, uh, the, uh, of the theorem of uh, Ananian and Mel, so of uh, um, Ananian and, and Oxen, so as a consequence of the solution of the Stillman conjecture, one get uh, as a result, uh, we have it in a joint paper, myself, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Chardin, 
um, Jason, uh, Irena, Vera, and Matteo. Again, just, yes. It can be bounded. The bound depends on the solution of Stillman and is of the same magnitude. So basically, this problem and the solution to Stillman are, uh, they are connected to, um, to each other. A good bound for one, a reasonable anything, for one corresponding to a good bound for another one. Uh, if I just follow this proof of the yes through the proof of Stillman conjecture by Mel, and you start with something ridiculous, like five. So I have multiplicity five. Which bound do I get? Well, think about taking five, five to the five to the five to the five, one, one exponent on top of the other, and you go up to 100 exponent. And you say, well, no, is it good? No, shrink. So they take that, that number, and do on top of each other is that our exponent, and you do it uh, again, 100 times. So say, you do it again itself, 100 times, and so on. How many times should I repeat this? Well, as many times as the very first exponent. OK, so it's, it's unthinkable. So it's absolutely unthinkable. Um, so, but, well, we would expect something reasonable, like a double exponential, perhaps. So in those type of thoughts, uh, double exponential bound are not bad. So that's the point I want to, I want to make. Um, so sometimes uh, I, um, I treasure the fact that uh, there are bounds sometimes for some invariants that are independent of n. And so anytime uh, I see one, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a little gem. It's, it's a very, they're very rare. So let's say results with uh, good, but I didn't even care about good, any bounds for something uh, independent. Of, uh, of n, of the knowledge of n, are very rare. One of those uh, is this very old theorem attributed to Castelnuovo. Uh, yeah. 1889, which says the following. So if you start with a prime, so same data as before. So p prime, I'm going to fix the height of the prime, let's say, let's call it H, and then I want the fact that the field is algebraically closed. Then what happened? Then the number of uh, minimal generators that are quadrics uh, in your prime ideal, so P02 of the prime, so how many quadrics you have among the generators, is bounded above by a nice thing, H plus one, choose two. No mention of number of variable whatsoever. And that's, that's why it's, it's remarkable. I mean, it's nice. Right? Um, but so once you see that, say, so well, what's next? Not so much. So um, can give a couple of proofs. So first proof using uh, using Bertini. Um, using Bertini, what do you do? You go modulo linear general, sorry, general linear forms plus one has to saturate. And you bring the prime down, right? Cut, saturate, cut, saturate, you go down. If the height, if the dimension is greater than two, you go down, you still get primes. Between dimension two to dimension one, you go down to radical. And from dimension one to dimension zero, you get a non-zero divisor. So basically, without a problem, you, without loss of generality, you reduce to some ideal, so you lost prime, you lost everything, but lives inside k of x1, xh. And so the, uh, the second Betty number of your prime are bounded above by the second Betty number of i, which is bounded above by h plus 1 over 2, how many quadrics you have in that ring. The key point is that in this process, the degree one part of i, so let's say, without loss of generality, prime in degree one was zero, so it was uh, uh, non-degenerate, and you don't gain any linear form in this process. So but this, this is thanks to the fact that the field was algebraically closed. There are counterexamples otherwise, and basically without this, there are counterexamples. Counterexample without uh, 
without this assumption that the field is very close. So that's the part where you need it. And because you, as you saturate, uh, the idea gets larger. So as you, you model the general linear form, saturate because of the Bertini, a saturation might add things. If you add quadrics, no big deal. You bound something, uh, it's even better. I mean, you bound something that will be larger than what you care. But if you add the linear form, the linear form can kill anything. Can kill quadrics. How many quadrics can kill? Quite a lot. I mean, a single linear form can kill as many quadrics uh, as the number of variables. So can kill and not under controlled data. So that's crucial. Now, what's surprising is basically, uh, so that's a proof one, and since uh, the, the uh, since the conference in about, uh, uh, let's say, second proof, is about characteristic P method, this is due to Craig. For basically, what you do, you reduce uh, to characteristic positive. Then uh, you take your S mod P. This sits inside the T, let's say, a graded plus closure. And uh, you take a system of parameter here, lift to a regular sequence. And when you mod out to the system of parameter, if in this process you lost some quadrics, uh, then the system of parameter in the, in the plus closure will have more CZG than what you would have expected. So this, the quadrant that you kill here, if something goes wrong in your estimate, correspond to more CZG. But here it's a regular sequence, so you, have, you know how many you have to have. So that's a sketch of this part. So what do we did with, uh, and again, as far as I know, um, so from that, I mean, I expect there was going to be some attempt to extend this thing, but the method, the reduction of characteristic P of Craig and all the other standard methods that rely on cutting down, uh, they don't work for higher degrees. So I wonder, can I bound the cubics? Can I bound cortex? But see, sure, if you add, so the point is this condition, the not, not having extra generator, but if you get even a quadric as you saturate, a quadric can kill cubics. If the saturation gives you a cubic, a cubic can kill cortex, so quintic, and so on. So if the saturation add extra stuff, uh, those things kill an unknown number of elements, and you lose total control of that. Um, so yeah. what we did uh, with, uh, with Alessandro is basically um, we found a different route. So we found a different method to, to prove this, this result of this type. And um, our here, the standard is the following. So you start with prime, uh, let's say in S doesn't matter. So prime P of height, uh, height of PH, and that's, that's oops, our data. Um, then for every, uh, for every J, the number of generator in degree J of this prime are bounded above by a double exponential. So h to the 2 to the j plus 1 minus 3. What's the proof like? I just spent the last minute discussing the proof. So basically, what you want to do, you care for, actually, maybe let's just do the first step. So what you do, you write prime, your prime as a bunch of form, as many as the height. This is your regular sequence in the prime, colon some g. Uh, you assume the degree of G is very high. And so instead of studying the generator of prime, uh, you basically end up studying, so the B0J of P correspond to studying the B1J plus D of F plus G, of this almost complete intersection. How do you study a first CZG? Go up on a basis. Trier's theorem. So a first CZG is controlled by sites of a Grobner basis. Which Grobner basis? You cannot use term order. Term order use the last variables and add an extra noise completely under, out of control. So instead, we use generic coordinate, we use weights, and somehow we reduce the amount of noise. So the proof relies on the calculation of a Grobner basis with respect to weight. And the interesting part is that the weight don't get refined to monomial order. If you use Macaulay or anything, you care for an in respect to a weight, 
that way it gets refined to a term order and then the calculation is run. We kept the calculation at the weight level. Instead of a spare, we did syzygies, uh, and basically you compute this hypothetical Grobner basis and you can check that's under control. Anyway, so my time is up uh, and I think I'll stop uh, here. Thank you. So, any questions or comments? Excuse me. No, um, no, but see, the spirit of this is exactly the proof I gave you where I bound the beta 6 to 12. So, as the algorithm of Grobner goes, you bound what's going on in each step but uh, it might go forever. And yet the trouble is that these degree are not known. So you run a group in a basic calculation here that could start in ridiculously high degree. But it's like a group in a basis of a principal ideal. I mean, once you get rid of the noise, one, two. So it's like computing a group in a basis generated by a single element. There's interaction between those two, but uh, uh, can go forever. Uh, actually, immediately also, this is historical result of Dubay, Moore, Abai are surprising because the way a Grobner basis terminates Buchberger is because of Nitarianity. Even that thing is not clear. The proof typically relies on the knowledge of uh, number of variable and the fact that worst case scenario, as Mark knows, uh, is basically a re regular sequence and working with Lex uh, and you deal with the Stanley decomposition. But here, things are, cannot terminate. Yes, Serena. Just a moment. Uh, please use the mic for the uh, best recording. Sorry, I just missed it probably. Uh, is this bound sharp, you say? Uh, well, so this is sharp, clearly. Um, same example. The bound is not, uh, uh, as you change, without this assumption, there's no bound. So what I'm going to say, without the, 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 the field being closed, there's no bound whatsoever. And actually, without this stuff, uh, the bound that we get uh, here is uh, beta 0, 2 of p bounded by 2 h squared plus h. So we actually do get a bound without an assumption on the field, which is absolutely undoable with the standard method. Uh, but they're not sharp. Okay. But the point is that the spirit of those bound, uh, they're double exponential, which kind of fit perfectly the technique. Those technique, I mean, again, when you go without knowing the number of variables, you end up in these towers of towers of towers. So this is a you know, kindergarten bow in the respect compared to the towers. What about the CG, thank you. Yes. So the CG are completely under control uh, um, as well. I might not have the, the specific number written, but uh, uh, yeah, for every fix i in j, beta i j of p is bounded also by a double exponential. Okay, so, I think so this can uh, go because obviously we yeah. Well, it's not obvious because of the proof. You would like to reduce to a nin, but it's not monomial. But somehow what happened, and the, to get the syzygy, well, we do something. It's not obvious right away, but uh, you get a similar bound. So any syzygy whatsoever or any prime ideal in a single spot uh, is a double exponential of your data. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I forgot to mention it. Yeah, but here, I mean, the important point is to to stay connected over k bar. I mean, so yeah. it's not really to, I mean, to be prime. Not really? To be prime, I mean, over. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. And same here, actually. So basically, the proof that we do, even our bound, works for, uh, for radical, uh, a mixed radical, for instance, the same bound. And if you don't even care for a mixed, uh, um, you know, any radical, and you get the bound instead of the height, you use the big height. So any radical idea, if you know the big height, any spot on any Betty numbers is a double exponential of uh, the big height, no matter with the variables. It's, it's quite a step from, uh, from Castagnolo. Some other questions? If not, so let's thank the speaker again.